just before we start, I just want to give you both a small gift from us, which is a copy of the scarf that's on here, oh, wow. and the copy of our, um, our sadly no longer reduced away shirt with new ones that come in soon. So, <laughs> thank you both for you. Does somebody else want to explain the symbolism of the shirt? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, really. So this is it's a tribute to people who went out to fight in Spain in '36. Uh, so the stars on the top are from the International Brigade, and obviously the um, the colours of the Republican flag of Spain. And we have sold I don't know how many seventeen thousand of them. Which basically paid for this building and that little bitch. So, wow. um, anyway, let me pass it to myself. Cheers, Kevin. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you so, so much. much. These are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, thank you, and, and, uh, and uh, Jordan. Uh, that was really an incredible film. Really, really powerful. I know you've been there. So amazingly creative at such a, such a young age, but uh, I, I would read me like, oh my god, made your first film, started making films at the age of nine, and award winning films at 13, and you started your film when you were 19. Yeah. Wow. wow. I, often, at least in activist circles here in the UK, we say, you know, one of the greatest victories in Americanism has been what it's done to our imagination, that it doesn't let us imagine we've got something in the past. Before, now, or after, and one of the ways to combat that, of course, is to, to tell different stories, the stories of our existence. So, I just was interested in that, how you, that storytelling art that you, you, you went through, and it was quite powerful, different places, different countries, and maybe just lead us through that process of, of that storytelling. Yeah, well, storytelling in my culture is like the way that we tell our history and tell our culture. Most of our history was completely erased, and written history and documented history was burned. Um, and so we lost a whole lot of it, and so we really had to depend on word of mouth and by storytelling. And so filmmaking is a really powerful way for us as indigenous people to continue to remind people that we're still here, that we still exist, because it's the only way that we have of our history left at this moment. And I think, you know, Jordan went to Colombia, and um, we had seen things in Colombia, and I'm from Black Mesa, and when we met up for the first time and we started comparing and contrasting the two locations, we really saw like this differences, but also the main similarities. It was the same corporation. It was like really got down to like the language and the monkeys were the largest differences that were between those two locations. And so it really helped to bring to light the fact that this story needed to be told because everywhere you look, this is a common story. It's a common theme that's happening. Um, everywhere we've gone here in England, everywhere we've gone in Canada, in the US, and Colombia, people are constantly like, do you know about this thing? Do you know about this one? Do you know about, and no, most of the time I don't know because there's so much stuff happening. I'm not always fully aware of it, but I hope that everyone leaves tonight here going, what can I do in my own backyard? And it seems like y'all are still actively doing that. And if you are here, you most likely want to get involved in what's happening in your community. And so I really, urge everyone to go out and do that resource. I don't think that will fix any of our systems until we come at it from all angles. Um, if you want to get into politics, if you want to get into education, if you want to get into community work, if you want to get into direct action, all of those are ways of resistance and forms of resistance that are really possible to make this happen. And if you want to get into storytelling, I highly urge you to do it because I think that everybody has a unique and incredibly like imaginative perspective and I want to see all of those mm. perspectives. Absolutely, and I think uh, here in the UK at this moment, we're in a, a multi multiple crisis, and I think one of uh, the things about resistance has been being able to tell the stories of our own power, right? Of how we change society historically uh, through collective struggle. And I, I wonder if I asked both of you in both of the direction of this, <coughs> how you came about choosing the, the name. What it meant to both of you? Yeah, I mean, actually, Eva, our other producer, who is hiding out there in the audience, uh, <laughs> suggested a few names, and uh, and I and I presented them to Ivy Camille, and I think our ones really resonated. And you know, I think over years we talked about other names like uh, 
land back, which I think gets at some of the, the movement, but I think it's already sort of a movement hashtag, maybe want to like take that away. There's already this sort of indigenous like hashtag of land back, but uh, I don't know, even maybe Eva, do you have anything to say about power land? <laughs> I'm filming. So I thought Ivy right. Camille came up with a name, actually. I don't. We'll have to look at this. <laughs> we have to find the emails and go back to yeah. all of it. I mean, we settled on Powerlands maybe five years ago. Yeah, right? I think it was, yeah, it's been a while. So I don't think any of us really remember the exact origins. But it is really relevant. Like, obviously, it fits the film, it fits everywhere. Either you need power or you're extracting power. Yeah, and I think the film does get at the multiple meanings of the word power, right? You know, it's like, it's the power of people to resist, the power that's being extracted, the fact that, like, power is literally, like, hidden in the land in some of these cases, in multiple ways in which, like, the land is a source of power for the people, and then the power that's getting extracted from the land. So, I, which is what I took from that. Yeah. <laughs> so really clever. That's <laughs> totally the middle. Um, I was saying to Heidi just on the uh, kind of because we were sitting down with um, when when that if, when the first images of Standing Rock came in, you know, and start flashing around the world. Um, I wondered if whether you consciously, when you were thinking about what you were what you were including from Standing Rock, that that was when, when you know that line that was often in there, the, the older generation teaching resistance to the new generation to give them support, but also the resilience of struggle. Yeah, well, I love the A movement. A movement stands for American Indian Movement. Um, it is incredible. In the 1970s, they took back Alcatraz, and it's like still to this day a massive memorial to the resistance that can happen for indigenous people. Granted, the land was supposed to return and still has it, so like, ugh, it's a whole thing. Um, and there are many people who were from A who are still in prison and still actively like fighting those imprisonments. But, yeah, I've grown up with AIM. Uh, I grew up in Black Mesa, and AIM has been a huge part of it. And also when I was like 14, got honored by Colorado AIM, which is like a really big deal. And I still have the blanket I got from them, which was like a really big deal. Um, so I love the AIM movement. And I don't think there was necessarily, I don't know, there's so many times when people ask these questions where they're like so detailed and in depth. And I hate to be like, yeah, I don't think of it that deeply, but I guess so maybe. <laughs> And I think that's one of those where it's like, I couldn't do anything without AIM influencing. I mean, the, the video literally opens with the AIM movement song. So obviously they've influenced me to this point where like, I don't even have to consciously think about it. I'm still just like, oh, we're putting AIM in there. Like, it's definitely always around and happening. And yeah, I've been very lucky to be able to meet a lot of really spectacular AIM movements and be involved with them. But yeah, I don't think it was necessarily Conscientious. I think the film is really multi generational, though, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, Marie Bladeau, who we talked to at the very beginning, you know, she is like a movement elder who's been in this for a long time. And then it's not really in the film, but she talks a lot about her mother, who is uh, uh, Catherine. Catherine. Yeah, who's a, uh, like a kind of thing. I knew probably more about her than me, but is a famous like movement elder in her own way. Wow. Yeah, well also a lot of the women, so my Nelly, which means grandmother on your father's side in Navajo, was, um, she was like a fucking badass. She would go and there were multiple stories of her like marching up to Washington DC and literally like yelling at senators and congressmen like in Navajo and like cursing them out for the shit that they were doing. She also would go toe to toe with like Back in the day, um, they were doing the Bennett Freeze Act, which like made this whole thing where um, you weren't allowed to build new things on the land. So you had to either um, rebuild from current stuff that was already there, or like you couldn't, but it had to be to an already existing structure. So it meant that if someone came out and broke your glass windows, you couldn't repair your glass windows because you couldn't bring new glass on to fix it. The only thing you could do was find stuff that was already on the land to like put up into it, which was usually like a garbage bag or like some wood. They also restricted how many sheep, cows, and horses you were allowed to have. So they would do random impoundments where they would just come out with helicopters and um, like motor bikes and essentially chase all of your animals into a corral. Once they were in the corral, you could buy them out of the corral 
but for like it was a she for a sheep it was three hundred dollars for each sheep for a horse it was five hundred dollars for each horse and for a cow it was six hundred dollars for each cow most of these people don't have jobs they're not working with this thing they live completely off the land so whatever the impoundments would happen you have to like fundraise money to be able to hopefully get out maybe one or two of your animals um, and that would really devastate a lot of communities Anyways, I got a whole side tangent. <laughs> no, but for people in the film that are in like their 60s, 70s, and 80s, yeah. then there's like teenagers in the film also. And even Celeste, I think it's not, I think it's not in the final film, but Celeste, who's like 19 when we're filming with them, talks about, it's about the next seven generations on. So I do feel like yeah. the film, like spans generations within the film, and like the young people are thinking about the next generation, and the older people think about the next and the previous, like, well, it's just like a dream. And we're raised to think three generations, so the whole idea is, one, you can't own land, because no matter, like, when you die, the land stays there, so, like, you can't own it, but you can shepherd it, and we're put on the earth to be shepherds, and you work three generations ahead, so you're not making it better for yourself, you're not making it better for your kids, you're not making it better for your grandkids, you're making it better for your great-grandchildren. And so imagine if every single person in the world is making it better for their great grandchildren, how much further we would be in our like ecological resource at this moment and period in time. And so that's that's how I was raised to be, and that's how everyone out there is raised to be, and that's how we work. And so yeah, just having your house devastated, having all this stuff devastated really goes against that ideology that you can work towards a betterment of society and work towards the betterment of the land, because the land is what we is necessary to continue forward. I'll open it up to yourselves. So anybody who's got any questions, you yeah. have yeah, other time, of course, to put these two um, distinguished guests. Thank you for um, letting us watch your film. Which I, it was very stimulating. Um, right, I suppose the thing that really struck me, especially, was um, the Philippines. I mean, that's utterly depressing, you know, what's, what's going on there. Um, which of, there are numerous battles which, which, well, tell me about some you've won. There's obviously there's been a lot of um, crushing of indigenous people as well. What about some of the, some of those where you've actually made some gains? Well, I mean, I think you can look at winning and losing in various aspects. So, like. I don't know, there's like, okay, so Standing Rock after like thousands of people shows up, tens of thousands of people showed up, the pipeline still got put in and the pipeline burst like immediately. So that was terrible and in a lot of ways looks like a massive loss. But if you look at the long-term effects of Standing Rock, we actually see a massive win that came out of it. One, it reminded a lot of people that indigenous people still exist, we're still strong and we are here fighting for the land. And so that was a massive win in that sense. It also showed a lot of people the power that social media can have within these resistances. And it showed a lot of corporations that they also, if they follow and work with the land, will get support behind them. And in, I mean, like, like, nothing will be fixed until capitalism falls, but until that moment happens, we can actively push corporations into going into our benefit. Um, and so when they got forced their hand in that way, that was like, another win. We also have a massive win of how many connections came out of it. So many communities that hadn't talked before, that hadn't been in communication, were able to create relationships and now we call that KET. And it's that it's that everybody has KET, you just have to find the KET with everybody that you need. And so all of you in this room tonight, we've all built KET just by being here and engaging in this moment. And so from there on out, we'll always have that KET because KET can't be destroyed. And so it's like, from here on out, we're all a community, we're all a family, we're all doing that. And that's what Standing Rock did for a whole lot of spaces. So in ways you can look at it as though it was a loss, but you can also look at it as though there were wins. Black Mesa, it's the same thing. Uh, technically, Peabody Coal didn't leave. They were forced into bankruptcy. And so they have 20 years, so they'll leave. Uh, that happened in 2017, so they'll leave in 2037 where they can do pre-mined coal. So they went out and like blew up a whole bunch of the sites so that they could do pre-mined coal. So they're still extracting water and they're still doing that. But with them being on the verge to leave, it's allowing for all these people and all of these families and communities that were forced off to be able to return to the land, to be able to start cultivating it and be able to start bringing it all back together. And you have kids for the first time in generations because of these 
schools that were, you know, putting soap in your mouth if you spoke your language, that were cutting off your hair, which is a big deal, that were setting you up to like box and bet on you just because you were a native kid. Those schools are being pushed out and they're being held accountable. And so now we have these kids for the first time being allowed to explore and rejuvenate their culture. And so in a lot of ways, that's a win. Um, so it, there's always, I think, going to be a give and take. But I think that as long as we're constantly getting a better take, then, if we're, then we're on the upwards movement. And I also think that with everything going on, we see what's happening in Italy, we see what's happening in Russia, we see what's happening in Iran, we see what's happening in the States, which is like fucking terrifying. Like, all of this stuff is going on. But I think of it in this way that these people would not be pushing so actively towards their ideologies if they were terrified of the fact that they are in the minority at this point. Like there's a rising tide of fascism, but there's also a rising tide of resistance. Yeah, and I think there's more in resistance. In the States, we've seen it like, there, I mean, Democrats have been winning the popular vote for decades at this point. Like, and it's just because the only reason it's like there's like, there's like few, like minority of old white men are like still in power, but they're also like not gonna be in power for very long. And all of these young kids are like rising up and getting ready. And then maybe just, I mean, one of the examples in the film with Colombia and the YU community, uh, as one of what we, we, we work with some of those communities and resistance and terror on mine. I, I think there's also a real <coughs> message of hope, right? I mean, the vice president of, of Colombia now has come about from a movement to movement, and um, she was was exactly like one of those one of those community leaders. She came up resisting extractivism, went through political education school, organised in terms of the community, and has come about. And you know, okay, there's huge potential. You've got a government there now, and it's saying. You know, climate and inequality is the same thing we're going to move away from extractivism. So I do think there is is real hope. And even in, in that particular community, an incredible moment of repression, you know, because you don't we talk you, you talk about the talked in Philippines about the environmental defenders and land defenders being killed, of course, similarly in Colombia. Um, and despite the role of paramilitaries, many of those communities have popular referendums where they rejected the the, the mining companies, despite all of the inducements. So whether it's, I think, at a small level or a national or global level, resistance is, we say, fertile. The uh, part of what I take from this film is the importance of us connecting our resistances and stories, right? And, and, and imagining something different. So I wanted to just ask you about that, too, because, because what's very, very, I think, powerfully in this film, you also don't just talk about the fossil fuel industry, the wall of dirty energy, but you talk also about you know, renewable energy and, and the potential of extractivist logic being applied there. Um, was that a conscious decision? You know, it goes back to the question of hope, because everybody's hoping this, no oh, fossil fuels will all be renewable energy, and then I'm like, well, not quite that kind of renewable energy. Or not. Um, how did you, did you make that as a conscious political decision, or was that something that very much came from when you were researching the film? Yeah, I mean, I think all three, Eva and, and Ivy Camille and, and myself, we all talked about that, that I think it, we want this film to be really hopeful, so it felt a little risky to dive into this hopeful energy source and to bring up problems with it, but also uh, I hope that it still leaves with a hopeful message that the communities are building an alternative and that we're seeing that there is a way to do this responsibly and to do this in, in cooperation with communities. And, you know, just as a side note, by the way, I, I think War on Want is such a model that feels really similar to what we're thinking about with this organization of this systemic international analysis that is like lifting up struggles uh, across, you know, across countries on, uh, that, and, and looking at like systemic problems. But yeah, I think, I mean, I know you, you think a lot about this too with, uh, with the extractivism and, and in uh, in Mexico and how that looks with the, the women power. Well, also I think 
there's a lot of extractivism that goes around it, but there's also a lot of uh, brainwashing that happens. That's a huge part of the conversation that needs to be always at the forefront. Um, steel is 8% of our carbon emission. Mm -hmm. The inventor of the wind turbine actually wanted every household to have a small wind turbine and a small solar panel. The problem with this format is if you have a small wind turbine and a small solar panel, you are making your own energy and nobody has to charge you for that energy. So therefore energy would be free and sustainable to every single person. So that's where we switch from the for-profit versus the for-people model. And so these larger wind turbines then came into place so that they would have a way to extract finances out of you um, in this. So it's extractivism on both ends, uh, based on it's affecting our environment, it's also affecting your pockets. Um, and there's even like, if we look at these methods in different ways, like coal has a really amazing resource. It can purify water. It's one of the only things that can help to remove estrogen from non-potable water, which is a really huge deal if we are resurfacing out. It's one of the, only, it's one of the hardest things to uh, extract from water and the system that we currently have to create clean water. So we could literally make clean water on a much smaller scale than we are. Why are we burning the only substance that can actually purify water? Uh, so yeah, so I think greenwashing is this whole ideology that you are helping and benefiting the planet when in reality you are helping and benefiting somebody else's bottom line and their dollar line. Um, buying a, like a brand new electric car actually doubles your carbon footprint. The only way to lower your carbon footprint is by buying a used electric car, which means that you have to require someone else to double their carbon footprint. So that's not a sustainable model. But there are sustainable models and there are ways to do it so for me, I think that's part of the reason why I so desperately, and Jordan and Nivieva also so desperately wanted to include that conversation is because this isn't a sustainable method, but it can be. And looking at the community in Oaxaca is very important. They're gonna show us where we should be going. They're gonna give us the future model that we should all be doing. There's also a community wind farms currently in Bristol that are going really well, and there are ways to do it sustainably. So we should be looking at this outsourcing instead of allowing large corporations like Bimbo and Arrowhead to put up these larger wind farms that are polluting our environment and not keeping us sustainable. Uh, anybody else? Reflection, please just give reflection on what you thought about the film. Talk to these specific questions. Okay. Just a, sorry, a quick question about um, Black Mesa and whether, it, may, it might not be like a completely relevant question now that like the film said, the mining companies have, have are vacating. But whether communities are played off of each other. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> it's obviously a tried tactic that works um, in other countries. Um, and I've been through those villages before that have been bought, basically bought off by mining so companies who have paid for schools, developed the curriculum in those schools to be pro-mining, mm -hmm. Um, but I wasn't sure about what happens, you know, within the U.S. and, and like on the Navajo Nation and whether that was present. Oh my God. Okay. So what happened in the 1960s was Peabody Coal went in and asked, asked Navajo Nation and the Hopi Nation, can we mine um, this coal? And Navajo Nation said no, but Hopi Nation said yes. So Hopi Nation is what used to be a tiny little square inside of Navajo Nation. So what they did in the 1960s is they actually took a map, of the, a mineral map, and a reservation map, and they redrew the reservation border and it matches the coal seam so that it fell on Hopi land. But that will happen in the 1960s. Like this is like within certain people's lifetimes, like this is very new that this happened. And the treaties for this were signed in 1868. So like this had been set up a long time ago. It's very recently changed, all based off of the coal seam. Um, so therefore, like my family, a lot of people fell on what is called HBL, Hopi Partition Lands, and not NPL, Navajo Partition Lands. But this imaginary fake border, this imaginary fake fence is new, and we've been living there for thousands of years, but we are now considered illegal immigrants, and we are now considered environmental terrorists, because we fell on the wrong side of this new partition border. So there was a lot of, and this gets more into like, the interesting thing on the play on words, so there were, the traditional Hopis and the traditional Navajos, the traditionalists who were really for not coal mining and keeping our traditional ways and keeping our language. And then we have what we're called a nickname, the progressives. And in a lot of ways that seems contradictory to like 
widespread language, <coughs> but it was just because they were moving towards this progressive sense of like going for coal mining and going for all of this. So you had the traditional Hopis and the progressive Hopis, and the federal government went to go in and put all of the progressive Hopis into the city council chambers, and so you have our governments being completely overrun by people that we did not choose or dictate or want to be in power, then allowing and being bought off by these coal companies in order to allow this coal scene to happen. So yeah, traditionally Hopi and Navajo tribes are brother and sister tribes. We are, our, all of our emergent stories and all of our histories are intermingled. We are meant to be side by side, but because of Peabody Coal, there was a huge line torn against us. Um, when we talk about the roundups that would happen, we're talking about Hopi Rangers. And it's like, but I, I hate to say it that way and I hate to talk about it because I know it wasn't the mass amount of Hopis. It was just like a few small that were put in charge and like handpicked specifically because of the indoctrination that they had gone through in school because of these, all these systems that put them in this position to truly want to help these corporations and help put them in power. But yeah, we're thrown against each other constantly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to mention, I think we have some similar campaigns, not exactly the same, but I know we've got an anti silver town protest, tunnel protest going on. There's a meeting on the 9th, I just wanted to raise that for people if they're interested, because they're trying to build a new tunnel across the Thames. It's going to increase traffic, it's going to increase pollution in Newham, and we're one of the most polluted boroughs in London. So I think that's important because I work in a school, the majority of the kids in my school have asthma, and it's really depressing because of the bad air quality here. So yeah, not exactly the same, but kind of thing. So I just wanted to highlight that. I mean, that's highlighting what is happening in your own backyard. How can you help? And then right there is the answer. Yeah, thank you so much for raising that. Absolutely. Any other reflections? Yeah. Do you think the, um, as it is, the corporates were going to like perform their behavior? I mean, they brought this like ESG and the, uh, PR stuff. It just kind of sounds a bit like greenwashing. But you were talking about um, one of the, well, in the film, one of the communities had a communally owned uh, wind farm. That itself, I guess, would be a corporate entity to an extent. Yeah, so I get what you're saying. And no, I don't think these corporations will ever be fully sustainable and fully for the people because they're always going to have, again, a for profit model. And that's where none of us will ever truly be free until capitalism falls, which really comes into play. But the co-op and its community, so they haven't fully put up the wind farm yet because they're trying to find a sustainable way in which this community wind farm is truly owned by the community and is truly a community wind farm. They're also looking into ways to make these wind turbines um, act truly eco-friendly. They're looking into how do we stop the oil from leaking into the water, how do we prevent birds from running into them, and how do we not help to contribute to the steel carbon problem that we have. And so that's why I think it's really important to look at what they're doing. Um, so they're taking their time and they're being careful. And yeah, there's a huge possibility that they will become for profit, but they're not going to be outsourcing their energy for money. They are creating a wind farm for their community because right now they are living in darkness while that, that energy is being outsourced directly to here. And so everyone gets light here, but they're completely in darkness. Yeah, I think we should maybe think very, very differently about people's own energy systems and corporate owned energy systems, which are like profit accumulation and extraction, right? So absolutely, in the reality of the world we face right now with three and a half billion people who either don't have electricity or cook clean cooking, the only answer, which of course can't say you can't have the right to energy, it's decentralized energy systems and people's own energy systems which are community assets so that they serve the interests of the community. And then we we'll get into that broader conversation what is productive energy. And the best way to do that is of course as a community and not in terms of the extraction and believing that we could transition from a fossil fuel economy to a renewable energy economy in the same way. It's just simply not possible unless you deny loads and loads of people energy. And as we See from our own government, we were saying, you know, with the energy bills rising, you have to face a choice. You either cut your consumption or you get off and find a new job, or, as I think most of us think, or you go on strike and force them to their knees. Right? Yeah, there has to be, I think there's a, a the challenge of the logic of, of 
but the energy question really sits underneath all of that, and that goes back down to what you say, why power lines work and so on. Sorry, you were about to say No, 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 actually you said everything perfectly. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, I just, I, 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 you know, I, there was a really telling sentence in there from one of the Navajo elders, right, about that we're not separate from our environment. And for many of us who are working in the climate justice and in this, you know, the role of indigenous communities is really, really central, right? We, we say we have to uplift, we, we have to learn, and we have to think of a new way of being in, in connection. And do you think that's at all possible in, in the, within the capitalist logic? No. <laughs> no, because uh, an indigenous way of thinking, is, again, that for profit versus for the people. For profit is always going to, okay, for profit is the monarchy owning all the seabeds, and then the monarchy also being in charge of where the wooden turbines go up. So it's themselves paying themselves while you also pay them and they don't pay you anything. That's for profit and that's capitalism. Whereas for community would be the entire community being like, oh, hey, we're going to build enough small wind turbines that every single person in this community has wind power and it's attached to their own house and they don't have to pay anybody and nobody has to pay them. And because of that, they can grow the food that they want to, the food that we need to, and we're gonna have a community garden where everybody works in it together. And we're gonna have a community lactation service, and we're gonna have a community diaper service, and we're gonna have a community food service. We're gonna have community education where you can go and get different types of education. And that's how it works traditionally within indigenous cultures. It's a full system, all working together for the betterment of everybody. Whereas currently where we're at, capitalism is a very small few benefiting off of the majority who are just trying to live. <laughs> and most of us just go to work to pay rent and then you scrape together a few extra pounds for like maybe some food and maybe a beer at the end of the day. And maybe if you're lucky, you get a vacation. And that's that's terrible. That's not at all what I think. That's not how I grew up. That's not how I was taught to live life. You know, every day of life should include art and history and education and the vibrancy and all of these things. You should be able to, if you need to take a mental health day, if you need to take a day off, if you don't need to take off, take a day off, but you decide you wanna go see something cool, you should be able to do that. So no, I don't think that indigeneity and capitalism are going to function together. And I have this huge philosophy of instead of decolonize, so like here we're in England, which has been very colonized and works in the exact method that colonization works, which is the same cycle of abuse as which you you get colonized, and then you go out and you become the colonizers yourself. And so, uh, it's, I, I don't think that we need to go from decolonization, I don't think that that's possible anymore. I think that we can re-indigenize, I think that we can re-invest in ourselves and in people together as a whole and in community as a whole. And I've seen it happen over and over again in all of these communities where these corporations or these larger governments or these outside entities come in and tell us that the way that we're living, the way that we're communi communicating, the way that we're teaching or supporting or growing together isn't correct, isn't accurate, and it destroys them. But when that community starts to rebuild and starts this beautiful, like, budding relationship again, you see how much stronger that place becomes. And if you here make a stronger community that is anti these energy corporations and holding them accountable, that community becomes a widespread community because you're helping people in Black Mesa and in the Philippines and in Colombia and in everywhere else that is affected by these larger corporations. It is possible to make our world sustainable. I fully believe that. And I think we're really close to doing it. Anything? Uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah, and, um, I, but I, I was wondering, you know, obviously, non-Indigenous people making this incredible film with Indigenous filmmakers and, and um, <coughs> often, you know, when even when the Indigenous voices and, uh, and stories are told, I still feel it's often like the other, right? It's like, wow, isn't that amazing? Look, these lovely Indigenous people protecting the biodiversity and ecosystem. And it's still separate from us Right in the global north, like that doesn't have relevance. 
I mean, everyone is indigenous to somewhere. And I hope that gets across because we are all indigenous. And just because my indigeneity looks a little different from your indigeneity doesn't mean you're not indigenous. It doesn't mean that you can't go back to those indigenous roots and help to bring them up and make them more sustainable within our society and help to bring them all back again. Sure, and I think that was the, I was going to ask you, you know, here in the history of, of let's say, England, you know, we'd have to go back hundreds of years about the forced uh, enclosure of land and the movement of people and, and talk yeah. about that, 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 that kind, that experience which has really separated people from the environment and nature, right? I mean, that's what it's done in the global north. We see the environment as being something other, we exploit, not as bad as possible. And changing that, uh, I, you know, was one of the things that struck me about this film, right? That it was, it's trying to look, do exactly as you said, like make us think about what the different way of being will look like. So I wonder if it was from your perspective, when you were, how, how conscious that was, you know. I don't think your background would be too, yeah. very similar to yeah. grew up in the global north, looking at these. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that what both of you are getting at is this idea that humanity is just incompatible with capitalism. And you know, I live in New Orleans in the U.S. And after Hurricane Katrina, you know, we saw this disaster and people coming together for mutual aid, right? And and I think that there is, I think, just a human instinct to help others that is very anti-capitalistic. And in times of crisis and in times of disaster, that instinct comes out. And I think part of what the lessons that we learned from this film is that across these different cultures and across these different lands, there was this like similar cooperation, this similar resistance, and that resistance looks different, but also looks really similar in these different places. Uh, yes. Um, I would really like to know more about the, well, community owned wind powers, you know, generators and wind farms. And I know you said that the community in your film didn't get money to build them, but other, but others have. And I'd be really interested in how it works and any resources or links about it so we can learn. Yeah, I mean, Great Resources, this organization, Grupo Nyanza, which is based in Spain, that is helping them in Oaxaca and helping other countries too, and on their site, Grupo Nyanza, that would be a good resource, I think, for, um, for more information. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, also, I know, I just, I wish I knew more information because I just learned about it, and we've been on like a little bit of a whirlwind <laughs> series and been all over the place. But in Bristol, we learned that there's a community wind farm that's going there that they were uh, hoping to reach out to us to be able to like get in contact with Oaxaca. So I know that there is a successful one happening here. Okay, so I'm curious about how, how small the turbines can be. Like, um, you know, would it be theoretically possible to have? The one in, you know, the heart of London, you know, without disturbing people. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, so, so I. Really one on this football stadium. Yeah. yeah, no, I worked at this school called Star School. It's service to all relations. It's right on the border of Navajo Nation and. Um, well, Arizona, but so it's like this really cool school. They grow all of their own food. They live off their own well. They. Um, are completely off the grid. They have their own solar panels. They have these cool sunflower solar panels that like track the sun. They also have their own turbines. And literally these turbines are like seven feet tall, tiny little things, super affordable. They have um, four different types of turbines that I've seen on it because it is a school, so they're running a much bigger thing. But they have a tiny like little three propeller. There's also this one called like a helicopter where it faces upwards and goes like this. Then they have one that's got, they've got a whole bunch of different, but they're small, they're tiny. Like when I stand next to them, they feel realistic in size. But these turbines that you're seeing in Mexico, like you're literally like looking straight up. It feels like the waves are about to hit the ground. Like they are so massive, but there are small ones. <coughs> Do you have any idea how much the little ones cost? It depends. And you can go through different grants and different systems, but they range somewhere between like 600 to 1500. I, I, I was happy to give you, I mean, there's, there's examples yeah. of decentralized energy systems all around yeah, the world, uh, and they are all locally appropriate, and the people use a mixture of 
wind, solar, uh, micro dam, all sorts. I mean, it's, it's a real question of what we think about scale. You know, there are examples now in Europe of cities buying back their public energy systems, right? The energy systems. And it, thinking, was a, it was a semi serious idea that one could go in this building. Well, I, I am sure when. When, I think there's people who are thinking about that right now. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> when, absolutely, I think I think that the, the idea of this place, like many others, is as a community asset would be to to see how sustainable we can make it, right? And to think about its both its footprint, but also recognise, you know, when we're talking about all of this renewable energy, we're still talking about material, material input. And that material input mm. is exactly overlapping many of those extractive industries in Latin America, right? And uh, I was, it, when, again, when listening and watching the, uh, the, the comrades uh, talk from there in Colombia, we, it just reminded me of a few years ago before the COVID pandemic. We had communities from Chile and Colombia, um, uh, and here at the BHP. AGM, the uh, Bulletin, BHP Bulletin, AGM. And the communities all spoke about the impact of the extra of extraction, not just in terms of coal, and, but also the new, most rare earth minerals for the renewable energy, and of course, all the copper and iron that you need to do that. And we were talking about poisoning land, water, and it was really telling that the response of BHP Bulletin was, yeah, that's all fine, well, but we are the future, we're the green transition. And that is part of going back to that greenwashing, right? You can't fit, change the energy system within the logic of the capital. You have to have a different energy system, which should be about productive energy. So it wouldn't be about just loads of energy. It'd be, we'd be talking about what's more socially useful. And, and again, going back to the storytelling, it's, I think for those of us who are in the labour movement, it's reminding people that even in Western labour movements, the idea of bread and roses was we don't just fight for bread, and roses was about dignity, right, and about a different way of living. And so I, 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 I thought this was so powerful in terms of the stories that were that were being told. I don't know, Kevin, how long you want well, to... Well, we've probably run out of time now. Yeah, we've run out of time. Uh, is there one, anybody who's got any final reflection, comment, question that you might want to ask? Feathers, just to pick up on what you just said about the PHP bulletin, um, we're much more webbed into this here, even though that we're not extractors, through financial extraction, through our pension funds, insurance companies, the whole finance structure. Um, and there's, there's a lot of work to be done in that area, not just you know, stopping the mining companies. Absolutely. So that's a perfect way to end this. Because for me, that story of all of us, whether you were in, you know, the Navajo story, Standing Rock, to the Philippines, to Colombia, to Mexico, was a question of solidarity and the importance of solidarity. And I think many of us always say it's the most important word in the vocabulary of the working class, the word solidarity. It's what changed the world. And what does it mean now when we watch that? I think our solidarity does mean not just looking in abstract, but exactly the same. BHP Bulletin is domiciled here in the UK. We're the second biggest metal exchange in the world, we're the second biggest financial centre in the world. We want to talk about solidarity to all of those communities. They have one message to us, right? which is it's in your country, it's in your city of London where these decisions are made. You have to act, you have to act in solidarity with us. So absolutely, we've got to talk to these corporate giants. We've got to show solidarity with each and one of those communities that the resistance isn't over there in abstract in which we watch. We've got to be part of the resistance. So there are lots of organisations and groups and campaign groups that are working on the Mining Network, War on Want and others, all focusing on this. And uh, I'll do one big plug on November 12th. We have a global day of action all around the world, uh, uh, trying to link both the cost of living crisis, the climate crisis, but solidarity with the in the global south, there'll be a big, big protest taking place, so do come along, and I hope to put it out on their Twitter as well. 
But thank you to uh, both of you and to our reluctant third producer there, who is back to you as well. <laughs> Thank you so much.